If you have your Bibles, you're going to need two fingers today. Or you can use the insert that's in your bulletin. We don't have a, a, a single part of scripture that we're using today. We've got three different scriptures that we're using. Luke 22, 31 through 34. A little later on in that chapter, 59 to 62. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. Why these three? We're in a series called Jesus Is. And, and this is a series that is looking at Jesus through the eyes of Peter. And we come today to perhaps one of the most famous stories about Peter and perhaps his greatest failing. But yet we have to look past that failure to see what Jesus did with that. You see, Jesus is forgiving. Even when I sin, Jesus is there with open arms for everything, for everybody. And you know, I, I know that as I, I'm looking out and as I'm seeing the members that are here today, I know that you're saying, yeah, I, I know that. But, but as we get into this, there, there's some things here that, that I want us to take a look at and go a little bit deeper because I want you to understand what happened to Peter has been asked of us too. And whenever we fail, I notice I didn't say if, but whenever we fail, Jesus is always there with open arms to forgive us, to forgive us. Luke 22 starts out like this. Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Lord, he told them, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. I tell you, Peter, he said, the rooster will not crow today until you deny die three times that you know me. Heavenly Father, these are your words. These are the words Peter spoke. These are the words that John spoke. These are the words that Jesus gave to be recorded. And Father, we pray that you will use these, Lord, to teach us today. Amen. You know, as I was preparing this, I was reminded of a story that I had heard years ago. A story of a king that is going through his prisons. And as he's going through his prisons, all the prisoners are coming up to the bars and going, King, I don't deserve to be here. I am completely innocent of everything. I can't stay here. And as he's walking through, every single prisoner is there asking the king to forgive them because they have been wrongly accused. Till finally he comes across this one cell and there's this prisoner that's in there and this prisoner makes no move. This prisoner is sitting in the back of the cell. And the king just stops. But he, he's surprised that here is somebody that's not asking for forgiveness. So the king says, get up and come here. So the prisoner gets up and comes over to him. And he says, all these people are here begging for forgiveness. They're saying that they're innocent. Why aren't you doing it? And that prisoner kept his eyes down. And he said, King, I don't deserve it. 
I am in here because I am guilty of what I was accused of. I am paying for my crime. I don't deserve to be out because I am guilty. And the king turned around to the guard and said, get this man out of this prison right now. The guard says, what? I mean, he just confessed to, to all he's done. He goes, I can't have somebody who is willing to tell the truth to be in a place with such liars. Now, we'll be coming back to that when we get to the end. But I want you to understand that that, that story paints a picture of what Peter went through. You see, Peter at this time, he was very brash. And this story talks about his brashness, but it also reveals the brokenness that he had. But, you know, as I was looking at this, you know, there was one part of this this dialogue that I have overlooked for a long time, and that is the warning that Jesus gave and the restoration that Jesus gave. And we're going to take a look at this. And as we are looking at this, I want you to remember this, that we are all warned by Jesus and the Holy Spirit continually. We have to listen to what God is saying to us and be prepared to act upon what he says. Because sometimes we're going to heed these warnings and sometimes we're not going to. But no matter what our choice is, Jesus is always there to forgive us and welcome us back into the family. The only question is, am I willing to receive his forgiveness? Am I willing to receive the forgiveness of Christ. I want you to think about that. And let's take a look at this. Let's look at the warning that Jesus gave here in Luke 22, 31 through 34, the section of scripture that, that I read. Look at what it was. Who gave this? Jesus gave this warning. And what did he say? He said, look out. Satan has asked to sift you. Satan, that our adversary, our accuser, went and asked Jesus for permission to sift this disciple. The same one who enticed Adam and Eve to sin is the same one who is asking to entice Peter to sin. Satan has a long history of deceiving believers and those outside the church, the unbelievers, because he is the originator of all sin. Satan was not created sinful, but he became sinful because of his pride. He was created Lucifer, the angel of light, but he became so full of himself that he led a rebellion that encompassed one-third of all the angels to try to usurp God from his throne. Because he thought he was better than God. And the Bible is very clear about what happened. Satan and his rebellious angels were swept out of heaven and cast down. Here is where it, the rubber meets the road for you and me. Because Satan has continued that rebellion here on earth and you and I are the battleground. You and I are the prize. Because he still tries to entice us as believers today. And he tries to keep the unsaved from hearing the gospel and submitting to Jesus Christ. That is who asked to sift Peter. He is still asking to sift us today. He's still asking to sift us today. 
You see, I, I like what it says there. You know, in the Greek, this verse reads, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded, demanded to have all of you to sift like wheat. That phrase, demanded to have all of you, that phrase means to ask earnestly. It means he's there, he's, he's asking, he's pleading, I want this. I want this. You know, when, when I think about that, I think about Christmas time, and, you know, I know nobody else has had this. You ever had uh, children or people say, I want this, and they keep saying, I want this, I want this, I want this? That's what Satan is doing. I want you. I want you, and I, I, I'm going to keep begging until I get what I want. And what did he want to do? To sift like wheat. You know, to sift in biblical times, there were a couple of ways that they could do that. One of the ways is they had what they call winnowing forks, and they would just take the wheat and throw it up in the air. The chaff would blow away, and the heavy kernel would fall down. Or they could put it in a, you know, like a blanket type thing and do the same thing. But the whole thing was, was to separate the good from the bad. And that's what Satan wants, wanted to do to Peter. To put him in that state of agitation. To, to turn him around. He wanted to mess with him. He wanted to mess with the other disciples. See, Satan was going to be used as a tool of Jesus to separate those things in Peter's life. You know, sometimes we need to take a look beyond what we are in. Sometimes as we are going through the sifting process, it's difficult when you're being tossed around all the time. To remember that the whole purpose of sifting is to separate. Separate the usable from the unusable. My friends, in the trials that we go through, we must not look at the trial itself. We must look at what is happening to us because God is using that trial to separate that which he can use from that which is holding us back. Now, if you've got sensitive toes, either put them on the pew or curl them up. Because let me tell you something. As I'm looking out here across this audience, too many of us look at the trials. And we are so enamored at the trials and what it's doing to us that we forget to look at God and what he is doing for us to make us better and usable. And I urge you to get your eyes off the trial and put your eyes back on the cross. All trials are meant to do is to bring us closer to God so we rely more on him. And it ain't an easy road. But notice what Jesus said there in verse 32. Jesus prayed for you. See, now that word you there is very special. You see, in English, you can mean what? Me. Or it can mean you, plural. Here in the Bible, this you is singular. So when you read that in the Bible, I encourage you, don't read the word you, put your name there. Because Jesus is praying for David. 
He's praying for Wanda. He's praying for Lowell. He's praying for Tyler. He's praying for Wendy. He's praying for Don. He is praying for you. That you will hold up under the trial. Know that we have a great mediator who stands before God the Father who is bringing your name up individually in prayer to the Father himself pleading for you. Pleading for you. So we know who Satan was going to do it. We know what he wanted to sift. And when was he going to do it? See, Jesus got very specific here. Before the rooster crows, it's going to happen tonight. You know, every time that, that I read that section, I'm, I'm always reminded of my dad's prom. My dad grew up on a farm, and his alarm clock was the rooster. He said that when he went to prom, he got home really late. He put his head on the pillow, and as soon as he did, the rooster went off. And he said, I wanted to have chicken that day. Jesus was given a specific time. It's going to happen soon. It's going to happen before morning. And what was the result? The result was Luke 22, 59 through 62. Now, several things have happened between these sections of Scripture. I encourage you to go back and to read that. This section says about an hour later, another kept insisting, This man was certainly with him since he also is a Galilean. Peter said, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So Peter remembered the word the Lord had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. You know, there's a setup that's happening here. See, this happened right after he was arrested in the garden. And what did it say? And we'll give you the Cliff Notes version, but go back and read it entirely. Because you know what happens with Cliff Notes? They hit the high points. And they leave the details out. You're responsible for the details. I'm going to tell you the high points. Well, he was arrested. John and Peter followed him. And because John was an acquaintance to the high priest, they got in. It was cold, and Peter was warming by the fire. And as he was warming by the fire, people kept saying, you were with him. You were with him. You were with him. And depending upon which gospel you look at, one of them says, he cursed and says, I don't know what you're talking about. Peter turned and denied Christ three times over that fire while Jesus was being accused in front of the high priest. You see, no matter how hard we try, there are going to be times that we fail. Peter did not set out to be a failure that night. But in his own strength, guess what? As he was trusting in himself, he let himself down. He was not trusting in the power of God. He was not trusting in the power of Jesus. And Satan sifted him right there. Now let me be bold and say this. If Satan had not sifted him right there, if he had not been broken right there, we would not have had the Peter later on who says, crucify me upside down because I am not worthy to die like my Savior. Sometimes it's necessary for us to be broken so that God can rebuild us the way that he wants us so that we can be used. And what happened? After Peter said the third time, I don't know him, the Bible says Jesus did what? Turned and looked at him. You know, in the Greek, 
that that phrase carries the idea that Jesus made a conscious turn to look at Peter. As if to say, I told you so. And see, it was after he got that look that he was broken. And he fled and he cried. Because right then he realized how much he let his Savior down. Friends, we do that. We let our Savior down. But we have to decide whether we're going to accept his forgiveness. We have too many Christians across this great land that wallow in the self-pity of brokenness and will not reach for the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Listen, my grandfather raised pigs, and a pig will go and wallow in that mud for one thing, to keep cool. It's easier to keep wallowing than it is to get cleaned off and in the shade. Sometimes that's us. It says it's easy for us to wallow in our sorrowfulness, in our forgetfulness, in our self-pity, because that makes us comfortable. And when we embrace that, we turn our back on the cross. We were not made to wallow in self-pity. We were made to glory in the cross, to glory in his forgiveness. But sometimes it's very hard to give up that which we know, that which feels good, for that which is going to clean us up. And you see, and that brings us to this restoration. In the Gospel of John, chapter 21, listen to what it says. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to them, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told them. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd, my sheep, he told him. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. Again, there's some details that I intentionally did not put in here, but I, I want you to understand that they had gone fishing. They had gone back to what they understood. They had been out that night, and they had caught nothing. Does that sound familiar? Because one thing that struck me here was in the restoration of Peter, how much it was like the calling of Peter at the very beginning. Two weeks ago, we talked about how God told uh, Peter to go and cast the nets after they'd been fishing all night. And what happened? They caught so much, the boat started sinking. The same thing happened here. And John said, it's the Lord. Peter left the boats and went to be with Jesus. And look at what it says here. After they had eaten breakfast, there was a physical satisfaction that was there. 
after they ate, after they had fellowship, after they had been around. You see, because Peter could then concentrate on the spiritual that Jesus wanted to get to him because his physical need was met. Sometimes we don't hear God because we're listening to our stomach. Sometimes we don't hear God because we're listening to others. Sometimes it takes those needs to be met so that we can hear God. And Jesus here took care of that to make sure that there was nothing in Peter's way to take care of the spiritual. And after that physical satisfaction came the spiritual stressing. Now much has been made about the different uses of the word love here. I'm not going to get into that today. But I want you to know this. Peter and Jesus met where Peter was. And Jesus was telling him where he was going to take him. God meets us where we are at in order to take us where he wants us to be. This is not a case of I clean myself up to come to Jesus. You can't clean yourself up to come to Jesus. No matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you scrub, you can't do that. Jesus comes to you the way that you are to fill you with his spirit to cleanse you and take you. And what was, what was Jesus asking him? He uses two phrases in there. He says, feed my sheep. And that feed my sheep phrase, that means to go and pass through the sheep. Go and turn them out. Make sure that they're safe. But then he also says, shepherd my sheep. And that word shepherd means to, to shepherd, to rule over them, to protect them, to be amongst them. Notice he was telling him two different things. He was telling him, you need to protect what I am giving you, but you also need to feed who I'm giving you. See, he was giving Peter the Great Commission right here. The Great Commission is boiled down to that, to where we feed and where we guard. But I want you to understand this. And here is the beauty of all this. Who did he ask? He asked Peter. Peter, the one who outside of Judas rejected him the most. What God taught me this week was that even after all Peter had done, he was still going to be used for the gospel. He was still going to be forgiven. You see, you are never so far from God that, you, that he cannot forgive you if you come to him. God will always use those who are available. Who are available. And God is continuing to reach out and ask for your availability. There is nothing that you can do to separate yourself from God. Except to choose not to believe him. He has done everything he can to build the bridge. You have to choose to cross the bridge. And see, that was that divine command that he gave. Follow me. Follow me. Peter, it gives me such hope. Because Peter, even with all his screw-ups, was someone whom God was still going to use to reach the world. 
there's not a day goes by that I don't screw something up. And you know what God keeps telling me? You're mine. You're mine. Let me use you. You cannot move away from the forgiveness of God. So what? What does all this mean? Well, let's go back to the beginning. Remember the story about the king and the prisoner? Why did the king let him go? See, the king pardoned and freed the prisoner who was broken, truthful, and remorseful. And I want you to understand that, that broken, truthful, and remorseful, because that, my friends, is the gospel message in itself. This is how we are forgiven. When we come face to face with who we are, who Jesus is, and truthfully confronting our sin, when we acknowledge who we are, who Jesus is, and acknowledge that our sins separate us from heaven, unless we repent and submit to Jesus, then God hears our prayers and will heal us. We are freed when we realize who we are, who he is, and what he's done. When we realize that the creator became the created to redeem his creation. When we realize that the creation rebelled against God and that the bridge is there, and that's Jesus Christ, and he is offering a way to heaven over his bridge. You know, I love Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And one of my favorite scenes is whenever they try to cross the bridge. What's your favorite color? Red, no blue. Ah! And King Arthur crosses the bridge because the troll asks him, what is the wind velocity of a sparrow? That's right, African or European? I don't know. See, we cross the bridge because somebody else controls the bridge. It's a toll bridge that we're going over. And if we don't pay, excuse me, we can't pay the toll, but if we don't accept the toll that has been paid for us, we are never getting across that bridge. We will fall off the signs we will never reach the other side. But when we realize what God has done for us and that he has paid the toll for us, we can cross the bridge with him. I want you all to also realize this, that you, and I'm using this both singularly and plurally, you individually and us as a church, we are in the crosshairs of Satan. Satan is looking to tear us down. Satan is looking to make us look foolish in the eyes of the world so that people will not hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a Christian, you walk around with a sign on your back and a target on your front and Satan is always shooting for this target. But remember, Jesus has prayed for you. He has prayed for you. The second thing I want you to, to take out of this is that as a Christian, God will protect you and he will expose you. Well, what does that mean? God's going to protect you from the hands of Satan. But he's going to expose you to show you things that you need to repent of, things that you need to drop away so that we can follow him better. And Christian, there are going to be times that we will deny Jesus. And I hate to put it like that. I want to be cheery. I want to say that we'll never do that. 
But let's be real. We are all fallen sinners. And there will be times that we deny our Savior. But even when we do that, guess what? Jesus is still willing to forgive you if you confess what you've done to him. Because as a Christian, you will be convicted of your sin. The Holy Spirit will fall upon you and convict you concerning your sin and unrighteousness. And when that happens, confess it. Confess so that the path to God is clear. Because Jesus will meet you where you are and take you to where he wants you to go. Jesus will meet you where you are and take you to where, you want, where he wants you to go. Do you think Peter wanted to end up his life on a cross, being crucified? But yet that was God's plan for him, to use Peter to glorify him. And when you look at the life of Peter from his restoration to his crucifixion, guess what he did? He turned Israel upside down for the gospel. My friends, God used a broken, fallen fisherman to upset an entire nation with the good news of salvation. And the last thing I, I want you to remember, and sometimes this is so hard for those outside the church to understand, and let me be honest, sometimes it's hard inside the church to understand it too. But you are never so far from God that he cannot forgive you if you come to him. There is nothing that you can do as a Christian to separate yourself from the love of God. Jesus is forgiving. The life of Peter shows us that. Our life shows us that. Now our question is, what are we going to do with that? What are we going to do with the forgiveness that has been given to us? To show others. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we just want to say thank you for this day. I thank you for this central theme in Christianity. Lord, that you forgive us. Lord, your word says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. There is no cleansing of sin. And Father, you shed your blood so that we could be forgiven of our sin. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we can't even begin to say thank you enough for what you have done for us to forgive us. And Lord, we just pray that as we are here, Lord, that you will remind us of the forgiveness that you have given us and embolden us to take that message to a world that needs to hear it. In your name we pray. Amen.